morning. Thanks for showing up early. Um, we are a technology laboratory and we work with proteins. We try to measure proteins. And it is an uh, interesting question right now. And I'm actually uh, pleased to be here because I also forced me to think about some things which we normally don't think about. How do genomes and cell fate uh, relate to each other and what role do proteins have to play in this equation? And I think uh, they have a large role to play and I'll try to um, give first a li little bit of general consideration and then I will I'll po I point to a few issues where we think proteins can contribute. I think we live in a very interesting phase. This was a very interesting meeting to me to see some of these very intricate, extremely complicated mechanisms like, like uh, trafficking that are being ex have been studied for decades. And then there's the other world where people generate a lot of data. And I think we need to somehow bring these um, two worlds together. This is kind of the topic of my, of my talk. So we are a technical laboratory and I don't want to talk about techniques. I just want to give kind of a status report to, to calibrate the expectations and uh, the capabilities. So if we are, we have focused in the field of protein measurements for a long time to exhaustively measure as many proteins in a sample as possible. And as I can say, this has now been achieved. We can probably measure virtually any protein in a sample. There's a few uh, glitches here and there, but that works well. If we want to relate genotype and phenotype, this is not sufficient to measure one proteome. We need to work with cohorts because then only then can we start to see how system reacts to, con to specific changes, for instance, genomic changes. So there has been work ongoing to get to a stage where genomics has been for a long time. And that is to have a large number of samples, conceivably hundreds of samples, and have many analytes preferably all of them, in this case proteins, and to measure them reliably, quantitatively, in to generate the data matrix that has no or very few missing values. So this has been a, a huge challenge. I don't want to uh, talk about why this has been a huge challenge. But recently, in the last few years, we and other groups have developed massively parallel mass spectrometric techniques that are kind of the equivalent to uh, next generation sequencing, which allow us to sequence many peptides at a time and uh, basically cover a rep reproducibly cover a set of the, of the protein, a subset. We cannot cover the whole proteome at this time uh, in many <coughs> samples, but to do a certain subset, several thousands of proteins with very high consistency and quite fast. So this is the, this is the kind of experimental basis that I will take off from. So we can say that each sample, let's say this may be a cell extract, this may be a tissue extract, a biopsy sample, is converted into a single digital file by a mass spectrometric technique, which I'm not going to further uh, discuss. Um, this is fast. It goes from, if we could take, for instance, in the clinic, a biopsy in the morning and have the results in the evening, we um, can do about 20 such samples a day with one machine. This is quite fast, also in view of um, genomics, but we cannot do the whole proteome, we can do about 5,000 proteins in a sample. And, uh, but with very good CV, with very few missing values if we have a cohort, and it is the sample, the measurements are quite precise, and so you can think of it conceptually like about 50,000 western blots for, per, um, per, per sample. So this is, a, this is, a, this is kind of what, what we're doing. This is also applicable to modifications and protein interactions. So this is where I would like to start and, and it's just to kind of the technical base without explaining how this works and I'm happy to do this if someone is interested. So now if you read the literature and, um, and, and these large scale genomic efforts, we read that we can do thousands of genotypes uh, can be measured in a cohort. Sometimes these are international consortia and for instance, cancer versus control is, a, is one of the most dominant areas where this is a, applied. And of course, we have also a lot of quantitative phenotypes from imaging, from, um, from, from the clinics, and from diagnostic tests. And so this, the, que the big question, I think this is one of the questions of this session it tends to address, is how do we make a link 
how do we make projections from the genotypic vari variants that are existing in a population or in a cohort towards a uh, phenotypic uh, space and this in the clinical sense of course is healthy or disease but it could be any, it's a general problem of course, could be any uh, phenotype. So we would like to predict phenotypes from their molecular origin which mostly is based on genomic data. So if you want to make predictions this is of course one of the hallmarks of science and there is many fields, engineering, physics, which has developed a very high level skills how to make predictions based on, on models. So I use just this uh, clock as an example, uh, as, as, a, as a system which is precisely understood and where we can make fairly precise predictions. So we know if we know the state of the system at a particular time, the, this clock, and if we know some of the uh, parameters, um, then we will be able to st say for uh, virtually any time in the future where the clock will be. And what, uh, because that's basically the purpose of a clock. We can also predict quite precisely how the system reacts if we change something in it. For instance, if we make the pendulum a bit longer, we can predict what effect this has on the, uh, on the uh, readout up here. So this works well for systems with moderate number of parts and the basic model how they interact. And so this is of course um, very rather straightforward system but I would just say there is equations which first principles we can plug this in, we can plug data and we can, we, we can play in a computer with parameters and, and then we will get a fairly precise outcome assuming that this system operates under idealized conditions for instance it, does not, it, is, it disregards friction of air and, and so on. So in biological systems we also try to of course get to predictions to, uh, to generate predictive models but we have seen over the last few days and this is actually discussed quite extensively on for instance Tuesday evening in the discussion that this is very difficult to achieve and so there were terms were uh, statements were made that this, this, this is usually uh, equated to systems biology and, and the terms were made or statements were made that this has been disappointing and I would agree with that but there are some success stories where really quite well predictive models have been es established in biology, oscillator, bacterial motor is one of the, if, if the toy uh, and, and really well studied problems, cell cycle regulators. But I would say this is, I would also agree that this has been disappointing from the point of view of generality that we can make general predictions. So good predictability has been achieved in these relatively limited samples, but they are relatively simple. Um, there are generalized models. They would be have a hard time to explain perturbations somewhere else in the cell, how for instance bacterial motor acts, the chemotactic motor, if the cell receives two, uh, two independent signals. This is hard to predict from these models and they're presently not scalable to really complex systems like trafficking or other uh, situations that were discussed in this, uh, in this conference. So while there has been successes, the way how this approach, a very highly mechanistically driven approach based on the understanding of the wiring and the components of a system can be scaled to larger systems is, is a huge challenge. And here I just, wanna, I just want to make the point how big the challenge is if we want to go from something very confined like a bacterial motor to um, making statements about a whole cell. So here a while back uh, we worked together with the group of Jörg Baylor to um, do basically a molecular inventory on a cell which has also been featured quite prominently in this, um, in this um, symposium and this is uh, an S. Pompey, Pompey cells. So we tried to use what was at the time the, the best methods we had available to precisely quantify, basically count the RNA molecules, the transcripts and the proteins in cells that were grown, uh, Pompey cells were grown at, um, at, at, at different conditions, basically in a starved condition and in an exponential growing condition. And, and this was, I mean, to, to us, certainly to me, these were astounding numbers. So we could see that a gene produces between 30 and about a million copies of proteins per cell. 
So it covers an enormous dynamic range. And, um, and, and, and of course, the question will be how is this uh, dynamic range maintained and how is it regulated? The median protein number is about 4,000, not quite 4,000. Uh, and the median mRNA copy per cell was about uh, two, two and a half. This, is, to me, was extremely surprising numbers because this basically means this operates entirely in a stochastic domain. So you must have cells if you have a population that some have none, some have maybe three, some have five. And if we then, if we then make predictions from, let's say, transcript measurements, if we put weight on an increase from two to four transcripts, we have to ask, of course, what that means because we, we operate essentially in a stochastic domain, but here we don't. Here in the protein level we don't because there's not going to be pro, uh, cells present that have zero protein and, and others have 10,000. Uh, they, they will always have some, some variation around, of course, these 4,000, uh, but the, uh, the, the mean, uh, uh, there's very few cells that have none. So it already indicates that we operate qu probably quite in a, from a conceptually in a different domain if we work with transcripts and proteins. The total amount of RNA molecules in these, in these cells was um, about 40,000, which is, which is basically you not know, many and means that from an energetic point of view, it's very cheap to make these proteins, whereas there's a, almost 100 million protein molecules are in each one of these cells, which means to maintain those, to control those, is very expensive for the cell. And another issue which is oftentimes not really um, uh, considered is that the protein concentration in these cells is more than 300 milligrams per milliliter. It is about a third of what crystallographers achieve when they squeeze the proteins into a crystal to do X-ray diffraction. It's an enormously high concentration. Actually, it's, it's a miracle uh, or it's, it's astounding that the proteins do not crash out because any biochemist knows if you want to extract these proteins from the cell and you do in vitro experiments, if you go beyond, let's say, 10 milligram per milliliter, the proteins tend to uh, largely precipitate out. So how the cell maintains its concentration and can carry out its functions is, is actually an astounding feat and which I think is not so often considered. And so most of the in vitro biochemistry, reconstitution experiment and so on are done at about um, two orders of magnitude concentration that's below what actually happens in the cell. So that's just to indicate that if we talk about cells, we talk about a very complex system and these classical mechanistic models have a very hard time to reach any kind of uh, comprehensive prediction of this model here. So now, then this, uh, given this situation, um, and coming back to the question kind of posed, or uh, that I understood to be posed for this uh, morning, was how, how are we do, we can ask how are we doing to predict phenotypes um, from genetic variation, which can now be very precisely measured. And the answer is, we're not doing well at all. And this is not just, of course, our group, this is in general, we have great difficulty to make this link. So we can ask a few questions, and which, we, which are simple questions, which we should be able to answer, but we can't. And I think uh, if everyone is here who would venture to say that they generally have an answer to these questions, then that would be very uh, good to hear. So we can, for instance, not say, we, we cannot predict accurately what the effect of any inherited or somatic mutation is on the phenotype. We can take a particular background genome. We could, should have a model where we introduce a mutation any, anywhere, let's say in a coding sequence, you should may predict what effect does that have. And this has not really been achieved. We do not know how to two or more mutations combine. Do they cancel each other out? Do they um, synergize? Do, are they neutral? We do not know how the same mutation affects different individuals, which is a huge pr issue in, in medicine, particularly in this emerging field of personalized medicine. And we also don't know how the copy number variations in an individual are processed. So, so these, are, these are seemingly simple questions which we should be, answer if we should, we should be able to answer. And I, I believe that before we can answer any of these questions, we some kind of have a path to answering those. It is, very, it is presumptive and maybe too early to really go into the clinic and try to make, con, uh, make statements about genotypic variability and its clinical outcome. With the exception, of course, of some Mendelian traits where it is very clearly understood what the molecular basis is and that how this translates into phenotype. And most clinical phenotypes are not so, are not so simple.
So to summarize this part, um, I think we are operating in an interesting time in the life sciences and we operate and, and try to summarize this in this graph here. So we have uh, an axis that indi indicates the data that is available and I indicate the y-axis the amount of, pr of pr first principles or theory that's available for, for the field. We have certain fields like engineering, health technology like the biotech or biomed tech, people who make a device, for instance, to monitor heart rate or, or blood pressure, which are in a very comfortable position because this is essentially engineering. There's a lot of theory, there's a lot of first principles, thermodynamics, electrodynamics, and so on, which are, which are used very widely and work extremely well. So for them, it is relatively straightforward with a limited amount of data to get to a predictive model. In biology, we don't have this uh, luxury. We have very few first principles. I come to this just in a second. But we, we have now increasingly uh, uh, a data. And of course, we also heard um, completely different types of data that exist and are generated from cell biologists from, with imaging, that with, with labeling. And you can follow a specific molecule exactly where it goes, how its amplitude varies, and so on. So this is also, of course, Im Im enormously dense data. So we operate now in, the in life science and medicine in a space where we have a lot of data available. But how these data generally in this genotype to phenotype uh, space relate to each other um, is, is a, to me a big question. And I'll come back to this that I think correlation, simply correlating data, is not going to work. So we have to find a way how to translate this data in predictive models. And this is the topic that I'm going to um, address in the following of my talk. We incidentally have whole classes of scientists or, or people who are, are, have very, very highly influential and important um, roles in society, doctors, lawyers, CEOs, politicians, that have neither. They neither have a theory or first principle how the system actually works, nor do they have data that they can actually do tests and can do uh, and, and can do any, any experiments. I mean, a, a, a doctor cannot have basically cloned a patient and do, and do experiments or treatment of some type on some and not on the others. So they have basically um, to uh, accumulate empirical, uh, an empirical base which they apply. So at least in the, in the life sciences, we are now in a domain where we can use empirically acquired data from uh, strategically positioned data sets that help us to make uh, predictive, uh, ac hopefully accurate predictions. So what are the first principles that we use in biology? We do not have models like the physicists do, where you can vary parameters and it simulates and makes a, an accurate predi prediction. We have some principles that we can apply. For instance, we have Mendel's law, Mendelian inheritance. We have the principle of Avery, DNA as a transforming principle. This, of course, is now taught to every undergraduate student. We have the one gene, one protein, one function uh, notion from, um, from Beadle and Tatum. We have central dogma. We have Linus's polling. I think this is an extremely important uh, insight. The, uh, the idea of a molecular disease that a particular mutation uh, in, a, in a particular gene leads to a change in a protein in a change in the, in the structure of that protein, and that manifests itself as a complex phenotype, sickle cell anemia, we have the notion that proteins only function if they have a three-dimensional structure. And of course, we have the, the most recent principle, which I think is a fundamental principle that we, we need to consider in this phenotype to genotype or, um, relationship, that proteins um, of basically of a modular biology, that molecules do not act by themselves, but they act in modules or complexes or, or however one would want to, to, to call that. So we try to come up with a concept that would integrate many of these principles and is experimentally addressable. So we call this the prototype model, and we, 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 uh, this is our notion that we are pursuing experimentally, um, that we, if we were able to define this type, measure this, type, this term uh, or this entity, the prototype, we would have an extremely informative entity that is fundamental to the translation of genotypic variability and phenotype. So how do we 
how do we define this prototype? We define it as the uh, composition of the proteins in a cell, the basically the inventory, and the way they're organized in modules. So this addresses many of the principles that are monuments in, the, in life science research, and especially it addresses the issue of, um, of, of Lee Hartwell and colleagues of a modular biology, and it addresses the issue of that variation, genetic variation, uh, that is happening somewhere in a gene, affects the structure and the function of these, of these modules. This is Linus Pauling's um, principle. So we, we would postulate that if we are able to measure this prototype, we would be able to make a useful link between genotypic variation and phenotype specifically we would predict, and I will then expand on some of these points a little further, that this prototype, so the composition as well as the organization of the proteins, is the result of complex processes, multiple layers, that are, that are poorly understood. We know that there is transcriptional models, there's models that predict how um, RNA interference or microRNAs affect gene expression, there's models uh, that define translational control, but and, and of course we have protein kinases that affect protein phosphorylation, and I think for all of these levels there is information, but we we would everyone would be hard pressed to integrate this into in a computer in a model into a comprehensive predictive system, and we think that the cell actually knows how to interpret all these or to integrate the control events at each one of these levels and basically generates one entity, this is the prototype, which is the result of control elements at various levels. We further would, in, we would assume that the prototype indicates the response of a cell. We know that, of course, that cells react to uh, external perturbations of genetics. I'll come back to this. Um, and that, that, we, that the cell knows how to integrate or how to react, and it, uh, it, it it, if we can measure the reaction, then we would learn some biology. So we would as further assume, this is um, basically the principle of Beadle and Tatum, and also from Linus Pauling, that the prototype determines the biochemical state and is therefore to be very close to defining uh, the phenotypes. Further, we do not ask what does the protein or gene product, uh, gene or protein do, this is, of course, largely known. We know a kinase phosphorylates certain residues, a ubiquitin uh, ligase ubiquitinates certain residues, a protease digests certain proteins. We know that, we can measure that in vitro, but I think the, the question we try to address is how does, the, the, how does the, the prototype or the system respond to alterations? So it, it's not just that we want to say a certain element has a certain function, but we would like to see how does the system react if this function is, is changed. And then we would, um, we would present this as a system, this prototype, which has different levels of resolution. Uh, eventually, there will be a high level resolution all the way down to crystal structures or atomic level, but at the moment, I think we have to, we have to assume that certain areas of biology are known in great detail and can be represented in very dense, uh, with very dense data and others are, are not. And I think the, the whole the, this discussion about trafficking is one field where there's enormous amount of, of prior information has been accumulated and we'd like to, to integrate this data into a larger representation at the level of the proteins. So, um, so this is kind of the, what we try to achieve and the considerations that basically indicate that we believe that it will be very hard to make inference or predictions from genom how genomic variability affects, the, uh, for that matter also environmental uh, insults affect the cell um, if we simply do genomic measurements. So now in the following I would like to expand on a few of these principles with actual data. The first, qu the first question I would like to address how does a simple genomic perturbation affect uh, the prototype? So now we go into a, uh, an experimental design where we induce on an otherwise in invariant genotype a, in a specific protein, specific mutations, and these mutations are derived 
from medicine, from basically they've been associated with, with a specific disease, uh, phenotypes, particularly cancer. And we ask, how does the, how, what effect does this mu do these mutations have? If they are in the same gene, but of different type, um, how do they affect the modularity, the, the composition of the respective protein module, and how, what effect do these changes in this module have on the cells, on the cells, um, on, on, on the cells uh, um, uh, protein, lan protein landscape? So the, ex the experiment is we, exp we express mutated forms of a protein and determine the effects of interactions and function. We use this, we use a protein kinase uh, DIRK2, and we use a protein kinase for that because it is easy to measure the reaction of or the response of these of mutations on this protein because the, func the function of this enzyme is to phosphorylate proteins. We can simply measure whether it phosphorylates different proteins or none or additional ones if it is mutated. Uh, and we measure then the effects of these um, of effects on this protein. So how do we end up with DIRK2? So we have a computational uh, postdoc in the group who developed a system which he calls, calls domino effect where she tries to combine the genomic mutations from cancer genomic data. This is a massive amount of data, more than 10,000 complete genomes from, cancers, from cancer tissue and normal adjacent tissue. And she tried, she tried to distill this down into protein, into mutations which very likely have an effect on protein function. And so she does that by um, basically statistical arguments looking at the, at the um, likelihood that a molecule is mutated at a particular site. And then she uses uh, prediction tools like do, these tool, do, do this mutation likely change the conformation of a protein or interaction of the, of the protein uh, that is affected. And she came up with what she calls hotspot mutations, about hotspot mutations in 156 genes, which we have a fairly high li likelihood um, that, these pro that these mutations, if they were introduced in an otherwise invariant background, would induce a change in the either protein folding, protein interaction. Would that be involved? How would you say? What information you use to distinguish different effects of different mutations? You say, what was specific about that? What was Regardless of the mathematics, there was some specific to study it or what? Yes, so the mutations have been all found in to be a mutation which have been found in genomic data says to be mutated in patients that have a certain type of cancer. So now we know that there's many of these mutations are, 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 are not known to be significant, so there's tens of thousands of them, and she simply tried to categorize them in those which have likely an effect on the, on the protein on the basis of first of all frequency of occurrence, and secondly, that they occur in the folded protein in residues, which either indicate that the protein might be disturbed or that an interaction of a protein with something else might be, um, might how be changed. How do you get this information? How do you know this particular mutation? From, so there is, there is... I give observation on this protein, pretorial data. So I'm coming to experimental data. This was simply based on, 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 um, on predictions, on structure predictions, and then where you would predict the structure of proteins and, and then paint the mutation on this protein. And if it is in a region that is, is predicted to be interactive, it, 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 is, it is assumed to have an, an effect. Yes, structure, stru structure and docking predictions. Yes, yes. Which are, of course, not very precise. Yeah. And I'll come to then some experimental data. Yes. How do you distinguish variants because you have three variants, polymorphism and causal, which is the causal? By the, by the frequency. So now this is the, the pro one of these 160 or 159 proteins that came out, we then followed up. This is a protein kinase called DIRK2. It is an interesting uh, enzyme, it's a protein kinase, it acts as a module, and this is the kinase itself. One of the protein it binds to is a U, uh, ubiquitin ligase, so it seems to be at an intersection of protein phosphorylation and ubiquitination, and then there's two other proteins here. <coughs> so it is a, the core is a tetrameric protein uh, that we want to study. So it, is, it has a number of disease-associated mutations, it is a tetramer, and the, some of the subunits as individual proteins have been crystallized, the structure is known. 
So now we select it of 80, there's an a 81 um, in this genomic data set, there's 81 mutations that have been mapped to this protein. Some, of course, have no disease association, and some do. And so then Maria filtered this down to, uh, to uh, a number, a, a small number of, of modifications that we test now. Um, there is a truncation where the C terminal tail is cut off. This is an event that happens relatively frequently in cancer. We have two point mutations at the site where the truncation happens. We have a mutation uh, which is in the activation loop of the kinase and therefore affecting, as likely to affect its activity. We have a, a mutation in the catalytic side, thought to render it invariant. And there's a mutation here in a region which we don't know what it's doing. So the, all these mutations which are labeled here and affect which are all not um, dreamed up. I mean, they're, they're, they've been uh, uh, occurring frequently in, uh, in patients with certain disease. We were introduced, this is the work of a postdoc, Martin Maynard, and it generated cell lines that, have, that express the mutated form of this respective protein. And, and then we measure the interaction the, around the core. So we see that each mutation, even though they may just, say, may just change a particular residue somewhere in the protein, which we don't really know what its function is, each one of these proteins has a different, if each one of these mutations have a different effect on the module. So this would be, the, the, we, the way we read this graph is that the, this is the mutation, this happens to be the one which renders the, the kinase inactive, and these uh, colors are the interactors, the, the three interactors of the tetramanic core, core module. We see if we in, in inactivate the kinase by mutation, um, there is substantial fall off or, or reduction in the <coughs> binding of some of the subunits. There's some mutations which have very little uh, effect, but each one does have an effect on the interaction. And so they, they all perturb the module uh, in some way, some more, some less. And as expected, the biggest change that is occurring is the truncation mutant where the C-terminal part is missing. This is fairly plausible. So, so the, what we know so far, the DERK two mutants, which have been derived from, um, from clinical information, show significant but varying impact on the assembly of this kinase core um, complex. Well, yes? How do you measure interactions? So we use two methods. One is um, affinity purification mass spectrometry, where we tag the proteins and, and pull them out and do interactions. And the other is called BioID, where we express a, mute, a, a modified protein and it basically labels chemically the surrounding proteins. And the two are not, the results of the two are not quite identical, but they, are, they largely converge. And the related question is, uh, is this in the context of the wild type uh, proteins? Uh, so this is uh, expression? Uh, on top of a wild type or a knock-in or, or So this is expression on top of the wild type protein. I'll then come to a knock-in in, in a second. So the message so far would be that oftentimes we would say, okay, a mutation affects this gene, the gene is maybe eliminated and, and or, or somehow modified, and we would then like an inference from this mutated gene to a phenotype, and what I try to show here is that each mutation has it, e even at this level of the organization of this protein with its core module, has different um, effects. Does it yeah. act as a dominant negative on the endogenous one? <coughs> uh, no, it's just expressed on, on. Yeah, but it doesn't affect the endogenous activity because it uh, will take the substrate. No, it doesn't because the, the endogenous is basically um, transparent to to these, these techniques. It could be that there is titration, so that, that the, if you express a, a, a tagged protein, it mops up uh, into interactors. It changes the equilibrium. Yes? So it seems to me that, that what one is doing is allowing nature to do the mutagenesis, and then there was a phenotype that came out because you had the patients, <coughs> and you're mapping that. That would have been equivalent that I would have actually started from scratch, done my mutagenesis in my protein, and then get my readouts, right? Yes. And right? So it's it just allowed evolution to do the experiment yes. for me. So these are these are mutations that are filtered, and of course we know we don't say that these that these 
mutations cause cancer, but they are statistically associated with, uh, with, 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 specific, with certain tumors. And what, what I'm trying to do here is to say these mutations that have occurred through evolution or selection in the cancer, even though they affect the same gene, are usually lumped together, they have an intricate and idiotypic effect on this module. And if you believe what Linus Pauling's mo uh, theory was that uh, of molecular disease, that the mutation affects the structure and the function of a, of a molecule, then it means that each one of these has an idiotypic footprint. Right, but this, that's, it seems to me that's the same experiment <coughs> I would have done in the laboratory when I force, let's say, I'm doing a screen of mutants, right? I mean, I can, let's say I could just drive mutagenesis and select for Yes, it. of course. But we try to, we try to, we try to make arguments that we, we, to f to f we try to find ways to use the genomic variability which is associated with disease let, let, like cancer and to, and to help making the link from these, explaining these mutations or, or, and their relation to, to the phenotype. Of course you could take any gene and you could mutagenize it and you could see what happens, but that's not uh, quite the question we ask here. Because there will be no phenotype in your experiment. Why? That's not true. What will you measure? Well, let's suppose, no, let's suppose I'm working on platrin, I'm working on dosetosis, and so I have a reader which is going oh, to be a certain yeah. phenotype. It happened to see, it's not disease, but it's, let's say, a failure to internalize. I do my metagenesis, I accelerate it because I did it in the lab, I get <laughs> the mapping through the protein, and then I cluster, you know, and the properties. So I, I yes, of course, this has been done. Allowed here in nature to do the experiment for you. Of course, it's been but done. But there is a big difference. You know, is, that you, difference? is that you are in, in nature, <laughs> and therefore there is no. It, when you, you are in the lab, you work in an isogenic background. Yeah. Not necessarily. Well, not generally. I mean, depends. If you I mean, do genetics, it's generally what you do. And, 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 and here, uh, that's the first thing you do. And, and second, you can exactly start to work on your mutation when you have isolated the phenotype. That means that you don't let the systems evolving further to, 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 to generally... <coughs> in the cancer, you don't have one mutation. You have many mutations I, that probably are... The first is the one that might have caused the cancer. The second one is the one that's allowed to survive the first mutation. So you have a, a, you have a very long evolution of, 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 a, of a complex pattern of... of no, I, I, I understood that, but I still, conceptually, I don't understand the difference. I mean, I'm, I'm just, to me, the difference is in one case, I allowed millions of years to do this, and whereas in the other one, I just did it accelerated. So, okay, so maybe because I'm doing accelerated, I have less time to, to do the more uh, spread thing, or maybe I'm doing less subtle uh, phenotypes, right? Yes, so, so I, I agree. If, if you work in 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 a, in a, in a, in a um, with yeast or with flies, of course, this has been done a lot, even with mice. I mean, there's been huge consortia that basically do mutagenesis and then see what, what phenotypes arise. And I would just try to make the point here that if if you then say the gene was mutated, that this is not sufficient granularity to um, to make eventually a mechanistic link because different mutations, even in the same gene, in a particular um, back genetic background, have uh, very different effects on the modularity, as I will show now, also on the function. But, but I think it has a much, fun, much more fundamental effect, is that when you do that in the lab, you are looking for a strong phenotype. So I have done an experiment, for example, where I'm looking at a particular pathway, I do an elimin let's say a perturbation in a gene, and then I actually we actually see compensations in the system. And sometimes you don't even actually we don't actually see a readout on the phenotype. The compensation is such that you don't see a readout. But since since I know the module, as you are pointing out, I'm looking let's say at the level of expression of some other proteins, and then you see oh, there was compensation. Let's say there was no phenotypic readout. Right, because the system compensated, right? But this so is generally, a, generally, this is a, 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 a rare case. In general, when you I do experiments know. in the lab, you, you, you go for the strong phenotype. And what, what is remarkable is that when you look in nature, you never have the same mutations. Okay, maybe yeah. we continue later. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Right, sorry. Yeah, that's okay. <laughs> no, I mean, it's it's the, the difference between it is doing it in people.
You cannot do your, the lab experiment in people. Okay. Yes, but I think the principles that we're trying to elaborate here will also apply to muta mutations that are, are generated by random mutagenics. But the point is, it's not unexpected, because you're looking at a very specific yes. function. Yes. And I mean, this mutant P19, blah, 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 is a Yes. yes. So I was just trying to say really that various mutations which have been selected and been through statistical arguments associated with the phenotype, that they affect the protein differently at the level of organization. And now we ask, what does it do at the level of its function, which is uh, to phosphorylate other proteins? And so we can, we can find on this protein a number of phosphorylation sites. We measure them and we quantified them and we can see that again each mutation has for these proteins, these few pro phosphorylation sites on the protein that are measurable are, have, a, have a, a different um, pattern. So not only does the mutations have been selected and expressed um, affect the wiring, basically the modularity, they also affect the phosphorylation state of the protein and then we also carried out, this is now a knock-in experiment, where we carried out and studied to see how do these mutations with presumably perturbed modules affect the overall function of this, basically the landscape, the number of the phosphorylation landscaper pattern of this protein. So the experiment was to take cells, these are, um, to knock out with CRISPR-Cas the intrinsic kinase to knock in then the mutant forms of these kinases, then they're expressed. And then we isolate proteins from these cells. We, uh, we purify phosphopeptides and we analyze these phosphopeptides in a mass spectrometer. So we generate about um, 1,200 or so phosphorylation sites in all these mutants. And by just simply clustering this, the phosphorylation patterns look quite similar. So that means that these subtle mutations in this protein do not radically change the overall protein uh, phosphorylation landscape, which of course is expected because in the same cell they have hundreds of other kinases active at the same time. But when we start to look more closely uh, which phosphorylation sites are affected, and we focus on this uh, panel over here, we see again the various mutants, these are now knock-in mutants, there's no more wild-type kinase, and we see that there's, uh, there's a set of proteins, is about 30 to 40 phosphoproteins and phosphorylation sites which are changing in response to the various mutations and these phosphorylation patterns change again in idiotypically dependent on the type of mutations. We see the complete knockout, this is the most strong phenot uh, uh, footprint here, this is the second to last. We have the deletion mutant, the C-terminus is deleted, this is similar, <coughs> less strong, but not as strong as the knockout. And then we have the kinase dead mutant, which is the third one from here, which is again similar to the knockout, but not identical. And then we have the other, mu the other mutations, which either affect uh, different residues, which have a footprint on the phosphoproteome, which is, which is uh, detectable, which affects specific proteins, but not as strongly as the absence of the kinase. So we can of course then look what do these proteins do and this would then provide a link to the activity of this protein or its modified form, the effect of a mutation of this protein on specific phosphoproteins and if you assume that phosphoproteins are uh, phosphorylation is responsible for modulating the activity we can say that specific mutations in this single protein DIRK2 mutations which have been coming through, uh, selected through uh, basically um, th through evolution ha have affect various, various areas of the cellular physiology. For instance, some map to um, uh, methyl, methyl transferase, this is an epigenetic complex. We have um, uh, g uh, this protein here, a scaffold protein activated with GTPases, so this is probably people here know a lot about this protein. Uh, nuclear pore proteins, which we also heard a lot yesterday, and, um, and cell cycle regulating proteins. So what we conclude is, uh, from this, is that if we take a number of mutations that have been selected to be related to disease, and if we introduce these mutations in, <coughs> uh, in this protein, in a cell, in other, otherwise isogenic background, 
they affect both the organization of this module and its function and they do it in, in, in a highly uh, modulated way and, and the function of this protein complex, which is a kinase, affects <coughs> different parts of the cell's physiology. So this, is a very, this points to a lot of complexity of how these mutations mechanistically affect uh, physiological processes. So this is basically what we conclude from this. And I would, the overall conclusion, the complexity of the cellular response to a simple genomic perturbation, one mutation, is beyond the reach of mechanistic models because we have no, no good way to predict a priori which parts will be touched by, for instance, a kinase or a ubiquitin ligase or a protease that's mutated. Okay, so now, uh, see, I'm getting, of course, very late. Um, we, I won't, I won't get through, so we'll, we'll see. The, then we would like to... Five, ten minutes, not more. Yeah, that's fine. No, it started late. Yeah, yeah, but I, I made a note. No problem. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so I won't get through the third part, of course, this is, uh, which is actually also... Well, anyway. Um, so now we, I would like to, to extend this to a situation. Now we have basically had one background, one mutation, ask what happens. And now we would like to go to more natural natural situation where we say we have a number of genetic variants in in various in a population and we'd like to ask to what extent can we use this natural variation to make linkages eventually mechanistic linkages for predicting a phenotype so to, so this is usually uh, discussed controversially and because there's a lot of people like those here who um, a very famous article by now who expunges the idea that we don't need to have any hypothesis anymore, we don't really need to understand mechanisms, correlation is enough. So the idea is if you pile up enough data, measure enough genomes, do geno GWA studies with enough um, cohort size, we will not need to make um, to understand the underlying mechanisms, we can simply make correlations and make statements. So this is, this is widely used in the, in also in clinical circles. I would like to show that this is probably, well, almost certainly an all underestimation of the problem and that this correlation will not be enough. So how do we show that? If I may, yes. uh, um, it, it's used as, uh, as, uh, as markers or biomarkers usually. And it's not meant to be a mechanistic yes. model, it's just if you have uh, 100,000 people with uh, this, this, yes. this, 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 and this That's mutation, true. and they are at this disease or this whatever, uh, uh, they are at this stage of the disease, yes. you can say there are good chances that if you have someone with this, 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 it's only, but it's only biomarkers. It's it is, and it's risk. It's not even markers, it's risks. And I think we know from these now very large, I mean, some of these large GWAS studies are now hundreds of thousands of, of individuals have been genotyped. And what of course comes out is that there is the larger the cohort, the more uh, genes show a small signal in these Manhattan plots. And so they, they produce a, a di there's additional genes or mutations in genes even associated with a, with a complex disease, but they are very, very small contribution. How these contributions can be used even clinically to make a risk assessment is actually very difficult. So I think um, this is a philosophical point. I think one needs to eventually, if one wants to do a risk assessment or treatment decision, know something about uh, the, the mechanism. Yes. Stories. So we now would like to explore. <laughs> We'd like to explore how likely it is, or how can we, how can we use systematically collected data sets and populations and mechanistic insights and prior information to, to learn something about the system. So this we do, we would like, um, this is the outline and this is the system we use. This is, uh, and we use this system because we think before we can make any headway into, in a system which is, has controlled known genomic variability, we'll have a very hard time to go to outbred, outbred human population. So this are, is an interesting collection of mice, um, uh, mouse strains, which has been generated by an international consortium. We certainly have not contributed to that with the beneficiaries of it. And there were two mice, a C57 black mice, mouse and DBA mouse were, were crossed. And then there were um, 
So there were F1 generation and F2 generation was generated and out of that there were strains outbred which are um, each one of these strains is genetically identical, <coughs> they're inbred and they all have the property, the genomes of these strains have the property that alleles from either the one parent or the other have been, have been uh, distributed in these strains and there's about 180 strains of that. So it's a terrific uh, resource because we, can see, we, can, we know the genetic variability. It is limited in a sense from the alleles that are present, but the distribution of the alleles is of course different from strain to strain. So we have, done, we have used these strains uh, and done in an experiment, this is an early phase with now a large, much larger data set which I don't want to discuss, but we selected 192 proteins which are relevant for metabolism um, and selected them for quantification across this cohort. So this, they cover some metabolic pathways. We, we took um, 40 of these strains which were grown either on normal food or on, on food that makes them fat. So there's an external perturbation. We have a genetic axis which is the genotype which is known. We have a environmental a diet axis and this, we did this for 40 strains. So for 40 strains we measure in duplicate under two conditions, high fat or low fat, and about um, close to 200 metabolic proteins. And then we want to see how this data set can be related to learn something about the genetic effect on, of the, uh, on the, or the environmental effect on the behavior of this pathway. So this is um, just showing that the data looks good. This is uh, the data table. So this is what I said at the beginning. We have now the ability to measure precisely quantitatively number of proteins across cohorts. These were rather low. For today's standards, somewhat low number, but it's focused and to make the point it's sufficient. And so we um, can we can now link using QTL mapping, quantitative trait locus mapping, we can now make a link between the presence of a particular allele at a locus and the abundance of a protein. So this is referred to as protein QTL. So we, 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 we assume that one allele uh, causes the protein to be highly, more highly expressed than the other allele from the other parent. And since we have a num sufficient number of these measurements, we can, we can, we can a proportion, we can, uh, we can relate the presence of a particular allele to the abundance of a protein, and it's referred to as QTL mapping. So what we see here is that the, we identify 44 from these 197 or 92 proteins, 44 QTLs, so these are low psi for which the allele affects the abundance of a, pro of the, of a protein. Some are in cis, that means they affect each other. I mean, the locus affects it, the product from this locus. And some are trans, the, the locus affects uh, the, ex the abundance of, of a protein that's coded for by different locus. So this is not super, uh, in super um, interesting or super remarkable. But when we also measure EQTLs, is the, the transcripts, um, which are also measured in these mice, we see that we have a rather similar number of QTLs links between the allele and the protein, but, they, but they, dif they have a different behavior. So in the, and the different behavior is that proteins, QTLs, act more likely in trans than, in, than the uh, transcript QTLs. So that means the transcripts, uh, the, the transcript regulation is, mo is more, is, is less diverse in the cell than the, um, than the protein regulation by genetic means. I don't get into the effects of the environment. And now we try to, we try to learn something about using this data plus um, prior knowledge about these pathways to learn something that may be interesting bi biochemically or actually clinically. So one of the QTLs maps to an enzyme that is at the end, the last enzyme in the degradation pathway of branched chain uh, amino acid, like lysine or isoleucine, uh, la, uh, la, like lysine, leucine or isoleucine. So these are degraded in stepwise manner, exactly as the Beadle and Tatum principle suggests, and each step here produces a metabolite as an intermediate product. 
So now we have a QTL, so we have a genomic locus that affects the abundance of this respective protein here, this enzyme, and this is either high or it is low. So now we can, we can correlate basically uh, these, the enzyme uh, a presence here, which we take as a surrogate for the activity, and we can relate this to the uh, metabolites up here. So we basically do something which is like a water hose, where we say we close the water hose, we have less, we constrict it, we have less of this enzyme, and we ask, do the metabolites up here pile up? This would be, be assumed, and if there is lots of the protein, a lot of activity down there, we would assume that then the metabolites up there decrease in abundance because they're processed. Okay, so this just shows that we can do this. So from the, the enzyme level, is inversely correlated with these metabolites, which are also measured by mass spectrometry. This is exactly the principle of this water hose, constricted or open. We also see that two metabolites up here correlate very nicely. So if one is high, the other is high. So that means the enzyme down here constricts the whole pathway. So we have now made a link between a genetic locus and the allele that controls the, uh, the enzyme level to be either high or low and the presence and the abundance of metabolites. This is a mechanistic link because we explain this by, by the enzyme activity uh, that is present here. Now, interestingly enough, we can find uh, then literature that says that, it is, um, that this intermediate product here, amino adipate, uh, is, is a small molecule that is being generated in the degradation of this enzyme, is has been found in a large cohort GWA study in the Framingham Heart Study as a, a biomarker for diabetes risk. So this is of course now an interesting case because it, it allows us to make the statement that through measurements, systematic measurements in genetically perturbed animals, we are able to find a link between a genomic variant in a particular gene and an enzyme, an enzyme uh, abundance, and this enzyme abundance affects the path activity of a metabolic pathway, the degradation of branch chain amino acids, and if this activity is low of the pathway, the, at the bottom, the, amino, uh, the intermediates pile up, and they are being found uh, to be a risk factor for a uh, complex disease, yes? So, do you know if the change uh, is due to the DBA background or the Black 6 <coughs> background? Because as far as I remember, DBA is more susceptible to diabetes than C. Yes. Yes, so there is, there is a whole range of, uh, of actually uh, disease phenotypic measurements in these mice, on, and this uh, is amazingly complicated. So there is from these mice, these BXD mice, there is uh, more s about 300 phenotypes have been measured, including some disease phenotypes. And, and many of these, these phenotypes are quantitative, so you can say, uh, you can assign a, a numeric value to them. And in every case I've, I've looked at is, is that the parents, the DBA mm -hmm. or the black six, are somewhere in the middle, so you can basically list, make a plot of the numerical phenotypes from strain 1 to 180 yeah. and, the, and, the f and the parents are always <laughs> somewhere in the middle and they create uh, offspring through the reorganization of the alleles that are far outside the range of the, of the parents. So this is of course uh, outside Mendelian inheritance and this is by for, for all of these quantitative phenotypes that measured is actually the case. Yes. Yes, no, I'm, I'm yeah, yeah. Okay, so I want to summarize this part. Um, I think the correlation of prototype and genomic measurements in genetic reference indicates very complex relationships between genetic constitution and, and eventual, um, eventual expressed information. We, we can, we can, um, we can, in very specific and simple cases, 
where there is a lot known about the mechanism, we can use this prior information to and, pro and relate it to the big data set generated. It's not a super big data set that I showed, but it's, it's a rather substantial data set. And we can, we can then reach a somewhat mechanistic understanding. And I think we need to find ways, this is a, I think, big challenge for the future, to, to systematically integrate large-scale data and mechanistic data like have like been generated by many of the biologists here who work on a, for years on a very complex biological system to then use this uh, general principles as background and to determine how they are modulated, how this background is modulated in, in a specific case, in a specific uh, genetic background or under specific con conditions. And that can certainly be elaborated by uh, by, by large data sets. So my conclusion clearly is correlation is not enough. It is a useful tool, but if, we've, if we think we can use simply correlation of large data sets to get mechanistic, biologically meaningful insights, I think this will not work. So I wanted to, I was planning to, but now I skip this. I want to show that this, how the cell processes gene dosage effects, and I don't have time to do this, I would just like to say, to summarize what it does, maybe I can summarize this in one picture. So this is basically, uh, we collected a panel of <coughs> cell lines, which from the sequence are essentially identical or very similar. These are HeLa cell lines. They're very frequently used in, in laboratories, 100,000 100, 100, publications but they are genomic, genomically instable. And so sequence-wise they're similar, <coughs> but the genomic landscape is very different. So the, here we map copy number variation of these cell lines that have been collected from various laboratories. The people do experiments. And so these are simply, we see that although they have the same name, these cells, and they're used in laboratories to do experiments, they're substantially different from the, not from the sequence, but from the copy number variation, namely the number, the ploidy of uh, genes in specific alleles. And I just want to draw your attention to this picture here. This is two of these chromosomes where we see hot is always high number of ploidy, green is a low number of ploidy, and we see that there's very large blocks of, of regions, chromosomal regions, which are amplified in, in these cells or not amplified. So it's very, it's kind of a, a green and red block. When we go to the transcripts, this gets already somewhat diffuse. If we go to the proteins, it gets very diffuse. So the, 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 the effects of this increased ploidy or decreased ploidy is interpreted by the cell in extremely complicated ways. And what I do not have the time to show is that the organization of these proteins that are coming out of these increased ploidy regions uh, into modules is a big buffer. It's one of the most dominant factors how the cell, how the cell modulates the abundance of proteins that are induced by a higher number of, of, of copies of a particular gene is the organization of these proteins in a complex. So if a protein is known to go into a complex and the other subunits are not also augmented, that protein is buffered down and is basically degraded. So that's why it's one mechanism, not the only one, that these copy number variations are interpreted by the cell or lead to very, very refined and actually strongly buffered um, uh, landscape at the level of the, of the proteins and therefore at the physiological uh, relevant proteins. So with that, I would like to finish and try to show that, or oh, this is the topic of this morning, that we can measure now with amazingly effective tools, a lot of genomic variability from very large cohorts, thousands or, or tens of thousands of individuals. We have lots of phenotypic information and the way we bridge this, I believe, needs to involve proteins, not just the abundance of proteins, but also their modular modularity. And I think if we, if we can make more headway into basically defining by measurements this quantitative prototype, we will have a much better situation to link genotypic variability to, um, to phenotypes. So this is my, the collaborators whose work I showed. This last part I skipped largely is the work of Yang Shenglu. 
together with Wolf Hart, who is a colleague at ETH. The Dirk 2 project is work from Martin Mehner, the postdoc, and this BXD project is the work of Evan Williams and Yi Bo Wu, two postdocs, and we work with the group of Johan Overks at EPFL who created and maintains these BXD mice. Thank you for your um, attention. <laughs> We may have time for a quick question or uh, two. Okay, uh, just yeah, that. yeah, so I'd like to go back to the list of principles you showed in the beginning and uh, about the predictability of complex systems. Yes. For instance, oscillations and cell cycle are typically yeah. the best uh, predicted. Yeah. And I think they are predicted because what has been modeled is the regulatory layer. So engineers distinguish between regular in, in any complicated system, distinguish between a regulatory layer or a control system or autoregulatory yeah. system and a basic core process. In the case of cell cycle, we all know, I mean, Tyndall and so on and so forth. And uh, in each module, either, either in a complex man-made machine or in biological machines, it's possible to distinguish a plant or a basic process, plant, manufacturing plant, a plant and the uh, control system. And uh, uh, engineers distinguish between those two components. Uh, it's relatively uh, possible, let's say, if not easy, to understand and module the control systems, if we can, if we work them out. This, is, uh, this goes back also to what I tried to show this morning, Tuesday morning when I spoke. Um, once you have identified the modules and the regulatory systems, as I said, is not hugely complex. It's possible to break down the complexity of the overall system, the cell of the organism, into modules and the regulatory system and the coordination among them. So this could be, I think, uh, a way in which we could maybe um, try to predict complex system by breaking down the complexity into modules and, the, and into the regulatory layers. Yes, this I, is what the engineers do, basically. Yes, I, I, I agree with that, and I think this is certainly the goal. The problem is that we are now reasonably good, not perfect, but reasonably good in determining the modules that actually do the work, but the control system we don't really know uh, uh, enough. I mean, exactly the point. And, and so I think it will be, so we have transcription models, which is one level of control. We have microRNA control, we have translational control, we have phosphorylation control. No, that's, that's, I think uh, uh, <coughs> the analysis needs to start from a function and understand what yes. is the control machinery, the control layer on that function. And this is uh, not done, it's very neglected in cell biology. Yeah, I, I, I think this is true. However, it's also very complicated because there's not a single level of control that controls the system. It is many that contribute to the control of a system. So that's why I think that we should work towards figuring out these control mechanisms, of course. But in the meantime, for I think foreseeable future, we are limited to or better off if we do measurements and basically take the point of view that the cell knows how, what control systems to use and how these control systems are used to control a particular process. And if we can make the, a readout that reflects all levels of uh, integrated control, then we would be able to make a, a better prediction. So this is a surrogate for having a theory is to do, let the cell do the work and do measurements which are close to determining the field. I agree on the goal, but not on the method. Okay, we can discuss it. One more question. <laughs> Woman, so, uh, um, wanted to, say, to ask if uh, you think about this uh, prototype uh, as uh, uh, quite stable uh, beside the non-genetic uh, mutations like uh, transcriptional noise or uh, epigenetic events. So do you think this prototype <coughs> are quite stable or a dynamic uh, configuration? So it is quite... It is quite a stable, it seems. I mean, we, we are not able to make measurements, of course, at a single cell level. So we always measure aggregates over, uh, over a, a certain number of cells, which, is, which can be good or bad. We can discuss that, but maybe not, not here. But in, in under specific conditions, the prototype is actually quite stable. But it is also strongly reactive. It always reacts. I mean, that's what I try to show with this mutation. Even a mutation somewhere in the protein, a single amino acid exchange, 
has an if uh, in, in this Dirk two kinase has an effect on the proteotype, uh, uh, which is actually noticeable. This is this, this is quite remarkable. So it's a very sensitive readout, but it is inherently quite quite stable because through mechanisms like, uh, for instance, the the uh, the buffering of transcriptional variability at the level of the modules that really matter for, for the function. So this is the what I had to skip over. Okay, we'll have to stop now with coffee break. Thank you.